you are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. We will examine the life of our master, Yahshua, by discovering his ancestors, family, and friends, by reviewing rare ancient manuscripts, and speaking to those who know him best. From the Vero Essene Yahad, now experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Greetings and felicitations, Havarim. Uh, this is your host, Jackson Snyder. Many believers have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but very few have actually delved into the scrolls, and even fewer can understand the scrolls once they get in there. I must confess, when I found the scrolls in the library in the mid-80s, I was pretty excited to take up what was available at that time, and read I did, but I couldn't see the significance of the scrolls by just reading them, not knowing the context or what the individual books available at that time were referring to. Later, I took up the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in the early 90s, I began to get the significance once I had an expert teacher to show me the way through. And since then, knowing the scrolls, to some extent, has not only enriched my life, but in many ways changed my life. More recently, I learned that some of these texts were from the first century, even mid-first century, and had to do with the life of the Master, and not only the Master, but some of the characters that we encounter in the New Testament. That was really exciting to learn that, and that learning changed the course of my teaching. In this show, we have Brad Brink, a member of the Vero Yahad, being interviewed by Linda Watson, the subject matter being James the Just and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Herein, Brad reveals what he has recently learned about the scrolls, and you can tell by his voice how excited he is to convey that information onto us. So, this is primarily a replay of an interview of Brad Brink by Linda Watson of Hebrew Nation Radio. And I'm glad to be able to replay this for you now, because Brad's assessment is not only accurate, but it serves as a wonderful introduction for us to learn more about Yaakov Hazadik, or James the Just, the brother of the Master, who may well be one of the leading characters in the later Dead Sea Scrolls. So without further ado, I give you Linda Watson and her interview with Brad Brink about James the Just and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I was going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, uh, the early, you know, what we've always called the early church or the early assembly in Jerusalem, the connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament. Well, I, I got interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls when I was studying the, uh, the, the sabbatical and jubilee years because that's a, a piece of, of history. And I found it interesting that they were basically preserved, the, the scrolls were preserved in the caves of Qumran from the destruction of the temple until the, I believe it was the very day that the nation of Israel was refounded that the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So, you know, to me, that couldn't have been a coincidence. It's almost like Elohim had, had put these scrolls in the ground for a purpose and that they were being saved for the proper time to come out. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, of course, the, the primarily the Catholic Church, more or less, um, got a hold of them. And they were kept by mostly by scholars, and the you know the Dead Sea Scrolls was something that you heard of, but the the common people really didn't have access to it. Right. And that went on for about forty or fifty years, and finally, through the the efforts of um, various scholars who were trying to get to, to look at these scrolls, you know, there were some uh, tenured professors that were just trying to study these scrolls, and they couldn't even get access to them, and uh, they began to to raise an awareness of this and and push to get them released, and eventually the Dead Sea Scrolls all got released to the general public. So now we have access to. You can go online. You can see the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can order copies of them. There's a number of translations 
out. You know, once the establishment finally released the hold on the scrolls, then the, the people, the common people, were able to actually what they said. And, you know, I guess it kind of begs the question, what was it in these scrolls that the establishment was not wanting us to know? Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, everybody, everybody's heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but very few people actually read them. You know, I mean, we've, we've all heard of them, but um, not many people know what's in them. And if you were to just pick them up and read them, they would be really difficult to understand what they mean, unless you have an understanding of the history in Judea between 200 B.C. and around 70 A.D. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, copies of Scripture. Um, some of the Scripture is uh, slightly different than what we have in the received text that's in our Bible. Uh, but for the most part, they're very, very similar but there's also what scholars have labeled secretarian works, and, and what they are is more of a commentary. Right. Commentaries on Scripture. There's some, some documents that have more to do with the organization of the group at Qumran and uh, that sort of thing. But the, the odd thing about these documents is that they don't name names. Like, um, the, the, the people spoken about in the documents, they have code names. The most... Uh, Probably interesting person in the Dead Sea Scrolls is this uh, teacher of righteousness. So, and there's all kind of theories about who this teacher of righteousness is. Uh, there are some theories that people think it is Onias, the last Zad- uh, Zadokite priest of the temple, who was removed in uh, 175 BC by Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, there's a theory out there that. In the um, in the book of Acts, there's a a man named uh, Judas the Gal- Galilean, and he was an early uh, zealot, a founder of the zealot movement, um, which he founded around the time that Yeshua would have been born. And there's a theory that he's the teacher of righteousness. But the, the the theory that kind of really goes against the grain of, of what the establishment believes, you know, they're wanting to place these scrolls around the year 200 to 150 B.C. The the scholars that, that have their own theories that try to place these scrolls in the, uh, the first century B.C., even they're kind of frowned upon because I, I think it's because they're trying to keep a distance between the Qumran scrolls and early uh, Christianity. But there is one figure who these scrolls fit very well, and that is James, the brother of Yeshua. Okay, yes. So most people in the church have no idea who James is. He's not a figure that's uh, very prominent. You know, when we when we talk about the apostles, um, the two apostles that everybody seems to know is Peter and, and Paul. But James, um, like I mentioned before, he was the brother of Yeshua, but he was actually the the person who took over the Jerusalem assembly after Yeshua ascended. Yes, he absolutely did. And history records that. Right. Yeah, we, we've got num- numerous sources that speak about James outside of the scripture. He's mentioned in Acts, but, um, you know, Acts doesn't really focus on James. It focuses most of its attention on Paul. But it kind of, you know, begs the question, well, you know, why was James so important to the early church, and why don't we know about him? So the the primary sources of information we have about James are the, you know, the early church fathers. They would write books about uh, where they would talk about what they called heresies, right. uh, different heresies within the church. And it's almost humorous that when they talk about the, the early history, they speak about, about James and how pious he was. Uh, he was known as the just one or the, the Zadik. Um, in fact, often in the writings, they wouldn't even mention his name. They would just refer to him as the just one. In some of the uh, the more Latinized uh, documents we have, he would be referred to as justice, which is uh, you know the Latinization of of uh, the just one. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, their teacher of righteousness was, you know, he was also referred to as the righteous one. Um, some things we know about James is that he was a vegetarian. Um, we have several early church writings that say that he he would only eat vegetables and, and nuts. He was a lifelong Nazarite. He didn't drink any kind of alcohol. Um, and... 
in uh, in or around 60 BC, he was actually put in place by as the people or elected by the people as a type of uh, opposition high priest. So when Herod took over uh, Judea in the first century BC, one of the things he did was he took over the priesthood, and the priests were all appointed by the Herods. So whichever Herod was in charge of Judea, he would appoint his own selection as the high priest. And so when you see Yeshua coming into Judea, he was always opposing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Sadducees would have been the the high priestly establishment. So the way that came about was in 175 B.C. when the Zadokite priests were removed from the temple by the Greeks— they ended up going out into the wilderness and were basically exiles uh, from the temple. Now, they participated in the, in the Maccabean Revolution, and after the Greeks were thrown out, the Hashmonians, or the Maccabees, they took over the kingship and the priesthood. And so, again, you had this situation where the Zadokites were, were shut out of the priesthood, and... The, the Maccabees, or the Hashmoneans, they, they kept the high priesthood until um, around the year 62 B.C. And there was these two Hashmoneans that were, were fighting between the, the high priesthood and the kingship, and they were basically fighting over the kingdom. And eventually they invited in the Romans to settle the argument. And, of course, the Romans just came in and took over. Exactly. And... By the by, the 30s BC, the the Hashmonians were either killed or exiled, and Herod the Great's father he was more or less a type of um, of uh, like a governor over Jerusalem. And then whenever he died, Herod came in and was named king of Judea by the Romans. Right now, so Herod had actually married uh, the last descendant. Her name was Marianne. Right. Marianne, and she was an actual descendant from that same group of people that we refer to as the Maccabees. And so she is probably the last known descendant, you know, that we recognize in history. And right. he married her for that specific reason because he thought by marrying her that would give him his children access to the high priest position. Right. And, you know, of course, Herod, he ended up killing her. And, you know, Herod, Herod tended to be pretty paranoid, by, especially toward the end of his life. And so, yes, his, he you know, he, he killed a number of his children and wives because he would begin to think that they were going to, uh, you know, to raise a coup and, and kill him and put one of the children in place over him. And so he was, you know, he got so paranoid that, that quite a few of his family members perished because of it. Right, he, that is true, and mm-hmm. he was under the influence of his sister, who was also very paranoid, and and directed him to commit many of those murders. Right. So, so what we see in the uh, in the New Testament is we see the reason Yeshua has these th- this problem with the uh, with the, the Sadducees is because he knows that they are not the righteous priests; they're not the true priests. Right. Uh, you know, the true priests are out in the wilderness uh, dwelling at Qumran and <clears throat> and writing scrolls, essentially. So, and that's what you see in these Dead Sea Scrolls is that they'll talk about the the Herods. They, they speak about the, the Pharisees as the uh, those that seek after smooth things or the... Their, their big criticism with the Pharisees is that the Pharisees is the party that kind of goes along to get along. Right. Um, you know, the Sadducees, they're essentially Herodians. They, the reason they're called Sadducees is that it's a throwback to the, the name of Zadok. You know, they're basically claiming to be the Zadokite high priest, but, but they're not. Um, in fact, Herod himself was a, basically a mixture of Edomite and Greek. You know, a lot of people think that he was a Jewish king, but he wasn't. He was a, uh, he was a Gentile king. And everyone, basically, that's pretty common knowledge these days to understand that he was an Edomite. So, so these these groups that are spoken about in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, we have this this righteous teacher who is <clears throat> opposed to the wicked priest, and the wicked priest would probably be Ananus. Or Ananus ben Ananus. He was the the priest in at the fall of the temple in seventy 
B.C. What he did, according to Josephus, he actually took James and some of James' followers and and tried them, and he actually had James stoned for, I believe, the charge was blasphemy. It was because James was this, he was put in place as this opposition high priest by the people, and Epiphanius, in uh, one of his books, known as the Panarion, he writes that, that James went into the temple, and he prayed for the people to such a degree that when he came out, his he had knees like camels, because he was on the floor petitioning for the people in the Holy of Holies. So if he was in the Holy of Holies, that would have probably been on Yom Kippur. And, you know, that makes perfect sense. Because um, that would be when you would be praying for the nation, because uh, Yom Kippur is basically the time or the holy day that we celebrate that where we pray for our nations. And right. it, and and it's you pray for the nation's forgiveness, and that would be in the in the uh, temple during Solomon's time, and when the temple was actually active, that was part of uh, the understanding is that the Day of Atonement is, was the forgiveness of the sins of the entire nation of Israel. So I just think that's significant what you're bringing out here. <clears throat> well, I've got some quotes, and I guess we could go through some of these and get some information you know, straight from the, the these ancient historians. Okay, the first one we have is from Josephus, and this is from Josephus Antiquities, uh, Book 20, Chapter 9. He says, Festus was now dead, and Albinius was but upon the road, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of, and he says Jesus, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, such as were most uneasy about the breach of the laws, they disliked what was done. So he's speaking about Ananus, um, and he conducted this court to to have James stoned. Now, of course, James was very popular with the people, and the, in numerous accounts, the people actually seem to believe that the reason that Jerusalem fell was because of the death of James. Um, Hippolytus says that James, the son of Alphaeus, when preaching in Jerusalem, was stoned to death by the Jews and was buried there beside the temple. And that was in Hippolytus on the Twelve Apostles of Christ and on the Seventy Apostles of Christ. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Eusebius, he quotes an ancient historian named Hegesippus. Now, Hegesippus actually lived in Judea during the first century, so he may have been an actual first-hand witness to these events. But all of Hegesippus's work is lost. All we have is quotes from different other other historians like Eusebius. <clears throat> but Eusebius in his uh, church history writes, But Hegesippus, who lived immediately after the apostles, gives the most accurate account in his fifth book of his memoirs. He writes as follows, James, the brother of the Lord, succeeded to the government of the church in conjunction with the apostles. He has been called the just by all from that time, from the time of the Savior until the present day. For there were many that bore the name James. <clears throat> he was holy from his mother's womb. He drank no wine or strong drink, nor did he eat flesh. <clears throat> no razor came upon his head. He did not anoint himself with oil, and he did not use the bath. Now, the bath they're speaking about is probably the, the public baths, because we know that he was a, a daily bather. Um, he actually would baptize himself every day. Um, but continuing, he said, He alone was permitted to enter into the holy place, for he wore not woolen, but linen garments, and he was in the habit of entering alone into the temple, and was frequently found upon his knees begging forgiveness for the people, so that his knees became hard like those of a camel. In consequence of his constantly bending them in his worship of God, and asking forgiveness for the people, because of his exceedingly great justice, he was called the just, and oblias, which signifies in Greek, bulwark of the people, and justice in accordance with the prophets declared concerning him. Now some of the seven sects which existed among the people, and which have been mentioned by me in the memoirs, asked him, What is the gate of Jesus, or the gate of Yeshua? And he replied that he was the Savior. On account of these words, some believe that Yeshua is the Christ, 
But the sects mentioned above did not believe either in resurrection or in one's coming to give every man according to his works. But as many as believed did so on account of James. Therefore, when many even of the rulers believed, there was a commotion among the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees who said that there was danger that the whole people would be looking for Yeshua as Messiah. Coming, therefore, in a body to James, they said, We entreat thee, restrain the people, for they have gone astray in regards to Yeshua, as if he were the, the Messiah. We entreat thee to persuade all that have come to the feast of Passover concerning Yeshua, for we all have confidence in thee, for we bear thee witness, as do all the people, that thou art just and dost not respect persons. Do thou, therefore, persuade the multitude not to be led astray concerning Yeshua, for the whole people and all of us also have confidence in thee. Stand therefore upon the pinnacle of the temple, and from that high position you mayest be clearly seen, and that thy words may be readily heard by the people, for all the tribes with the Gentiles also are come together on account of the Passover. <clears throat> the aforesaid scribes and Pharisees therefore placed James upon the pinnacle of the temple and cried out to him and said, Thou just one, in whom we ought to all have confidence, for as much as the people are led astray after Yeshua, the crucified one, declare to us what is the gate of Yeshua. And he answered and said in a loud voice, Why do you ask me concerning Yeshua, the Son of Man? He himself sits in heaven at the right hand of the great power and is about to come on the clouds of heaven. And when many were fully convinced and glorified the testimony of James and said, Hosanna to the son of David, these same scribes and Pharisees said again to one another, we have done badly and <clears throat> we have done badly in supplying such testimony to Yeshua. But let us go up and throw him down in order that there may be afraid to believe him. And they cried out saying, Oh, oh, the just man is also an error. And they fulfilled the scripture written in Isaiah. Let us take away the just man because he is troublesome to us. Therefore, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. So they went up and threw down the just man and said to each other, Let us stone James the just. <clears throat> and they began to stone him, for he was not killed by the fall. But he turned and knelt down and said, I entreat thee, Lord God of our fathers, forgive them, they know not what they do. And while they were thus stoning him, one of the priests, the sons of Rechab, the son of the Rechabites, who was mentioned by Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, cried out, saying, Cease what you do, the just one prays for you. And one of them, who was a fuller, took the club with which he beat the clothes and struck the just man in the head. And thus he suffered martyrdom. And they buried him on the spot by the temple, and his monument still re remains by the temple. He became a true witness, both to Jews and Greeks, that Yeshua the Christ, or Yeshua the Messiah, and immediately Vespasian beseeched them. These things are related at length by Hegesippus, who is in agreement with Clement. James was so admirable a man, and so celebrated among his justice, that more sensible even of the Jews were of the opinion that this was the cause of the siege of Jerusalem. Which happened to them, which happened to them immediately after his martyrdom, for no other reason than their daring act against him. And that's from Eusebius Church History, Book Two, Chapter Twenty Three, pages two hundred seven through two hundred nine. Great. Well, we just finished reading out of uh, Eusebius Church History, and just some notes about what we what we just read. He was quoting from from Hegesippus, who was a uh, a first century historian. From Judea, and he mentions uh, a couple of things here. He, he mentions that James was being brought up to the pinnacle of the temple, and one of the things that the uh, the scribes and the Pharisees were asking James about was what's called the the gates of Yeshua or the gate of Yeshua. And of course, in his translation, it says the gate of Jesus. I, I need to stop and take a little break, and and we're going to come back in a moment and continue talking about this with Brad. Now. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the War Scroll, when they're talking about uh, the War Scroll is essentially about an Armageddon type of battle where angels are fighting one another and they are fighting on the side of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And in that scroll, they mention the gates of salvation, which is the exact same phrase, the gates of Yeshua, that, that here James is asked about. Um, and some things that about these the Dead Sea Scrolls is they actually have uh, resurrected, if you will, some 
ancient phraseology that was used that was a, a type of, I guess, dogma surrounding the Messiah. Um, one of these was that there was a title for the Messiah from the first century known as the Standing One. So all through the Dead Sea Scrolls, you hear these these leaders of the congregations, the phrase that, that keeps popping up is that, you know, this person was standing. And that in itself is a... It's a, a type of signal that the person doing the standing is a righteous one because he was essentially, when we think of like standing in the gap, right? That, that's the that's another way of putting that. That is phraseology that you see popping up throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you see that also with James. We'll be right back. Since Nido Presents has returned just as we promised. When we think of like standing in the gap, right? That, that's the that's another way of putting that. That is phraseology that you see popping up throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you see that also with James that he stood up and announced to the people from the pinnacle of the temple. The phrase casting down is used a lot in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's used as a type of uh, a play on words. You read the Dead Sea Scrolls about uh, the righteous being cast down, and it's usually in a conjunction or in, in the same sentence being done by Belial. And the, the Hebrew word for casting down is very similar to Belial. It's, you know, Belial, Bela, uh, Balaam, all these B-A-L words are used as a type of, it's almost like a poetic use of, of them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you see that here where it says that, you know, James was cast down from the top of the temple. So, and this is this is something that was lost. You know, you don't see, you don't hear the phrase, the standing man, very often. But the, one of the groups in Jerusalem that's associated with James was this group known as the Ebionites. The Ebionites, it just means the poor. So when you see in the book of Acts that uh, Paul and Barnabas were collecting, were taking funds for the poor in Jerusalem, they were probably actually, you know, if it was translated into Hebrew, they would have been taking it to the, the Ebionites in Jerusalem. Interesting. And of course, you know, he, he, when he came to Jerusalem, he was going there to see James. So it's this association with, you know, a lot of us in the Hebraic Roots movement, we know the term Nazarenes. Well, Nazarene, was, it was just one phrase that the, the early believers in Yeshua went by. Right. Um, they were also went by the, the Ebionites, or the poor. They were called the sons of light. You see that being used by Paul and Yeshua. You know, all of these phrases are also the phrases that the Dead Sea Scrolls used to identify the people writing the scrolls. So there's Very a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk about the sons of light versus the sons of darkness. Um, Yeshua talks about the blind leading the blind and both falling into the pit. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the wicked are referred to as the men of the pit. Uh, you know, so there's the same voc vocabulary that's used by the uh, by Yeshua and his apostles that's used in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, it, did they mention anything about when the Nazarenes actually left out of Jerusalem? Because the history that I had, when I had researched that, they believed that they left out around 66 A.D., Right. And they left out three years before the temple actually fell uh, right. in the spring after a series of seven miracles that had occurred. And that led them to believe that God was inspiring them to leave that area. So does the Dead Sea Scrolls mention anything about that? They mention, well, of course, the flight, the, it's called the flight to Pella. Okay. Um, now, there's not a, a specific uh, mention of Pella. Now, they do talk about uh, a covenant in the land of Damascus. Uh, there's a document called the Damascus document. And the words of the Damascus document are very similar to what we read uh, Yeshua saying at the Last Supper about, you know, you know, the blood of the new covenant, speaking about making a new covenant. And uh, at the beginning of Acts, we do see that the there uh, seems to be an association with the apostles and Damascus. After Paul attacks at the temple, the James and the other apostles, they flee to Damascus. And so, you know, Paul's on the road to Damascus when he has that, uh, uh, you know, vision where he sees Yeshua. And Yeshua says, you know, why do you persecute me? Right, right. 
that would have been a little earlier in history, I think. That, right. That piece of history. Yeah. Yeah. James was killed in '62, and the the Dead Sea Scrolls they speak about his death as if it was in the past, the death of the righteous teacher. Um, now, after James died, Simon Barclopus. Some accounts list him as another brother of Yeshua. Some say that he was a cousin of Yeshua. Um, you know, usually. With James and with Simon, you have this um, this tendency to for for the church. The church wants to label him as as his cousin because you know the the church, the Catholic Church, had that uh, doctrine of the perpetual virg- virginity of Mary. Right, exactly. And and so and it's it's kind of humorous when you read some of these you know ancient church fathers like Epiphanius. You know, he he goes out of his way to mention that well, James wasn't. He he was born from another one of Joseph's wives who her name was also Mary. <laughs> and then someone else said that, that, that Mary had a sister named Mary and it was that Mary that gave birth to, to James. And you know, I, I couldn't imagine a situation where you would have two daughters and you would name both of them the same name. No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's stretching it a little Right, and it's you know you don't see that in in the scripture, you know, in the New Testament, James is never referred to as a cousin. He's always referred to as the brother of Yeshua or the brother of the Master. Um, so we have another reference here from Jerome, and it says uh, James, who is called the brother of the Lord, surnamed the Just, the son of Joseph by another wife, as some think, but it as appears to me, the son of Mary's sister, Mary, the sister of the mother of our Lord. So see, there, there. You, you see that where they're trying to cover up this relationship of James and Yeshua being brothers. Yeah, and you have to understand who Jerome was. He was the one that actually wrote the Latin Vulgate. Right. And so, and that would have been in the fourth century. He came much later, so he wouldn't really. He would be reading what everybody else had written, and many of the Ananasine fathers were teaching a lot of false information at that point. Right. So many of them have been educated in that school we frequently talk about, which is that Alexander School. Mm-hmm. And that Alexander School it was in Egypt, obviously. And Egypt is where Israel learned all their pagan beliefs. Right. That's where all paganism comes from is Egypt. You know, we came in from the land of Cana, went into Egypt, and was birthed there and learned all the pagan teachings, that, and they've been carried forward to today. Okay, well, but he continues from there. He says that John makes mention in his book, After the Lord's Passion, at once ordained by the apostles, Bishop of Jerusalem. So he's he's speaking about James here being made Bishop of Jerusalem by the apostles. Uh, He wrote a single epistle, which is reckoned among the seven Catholic epistles. And even this is claimed by some to have been published by someone else under his name, and gradually, as time went on, to have gained authority. Hegesippus, who lived uh, near the time of the uh, Apostolic Age, in his fifth book of the Commentaries, writing of James, says, After the apostles, James, the brother of our Lord, surnamed the Just, was made head of the church at Jerusalem. Many indeed are called James. This one was holy from his mother's womb. He drank neither wine nor strong drink. He ate no flesh, neither shaved or anointed himself with ointment or bathed. He alone had the privilege of entering the Holy of Holies, since indeed he did not use wool investments but linen and went alone into the temple and prayed on behalf of the people, insomuch that his knees were reputed to have acquired the hardness of camel's knees. So again, you see him going back to the same source of Hegesippus. Right. Um, Clement of Alexandria mentions him. He says, The Lord, after his resurrection, imparted knowledge to James the just and to John and to Peter. And they imparted it to the rest of the apostles, and the rest of the apostles to the seventy, of whom Barnabas was one. But there were two Jameses, one called the Just, who was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple when he was beaten to death with a club, and a Fully, and a Fuller, and another who was beheaded. So the one that was beheaded would have been James, the brother of John, and that's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. Epiphanius says in his his work called the Panarion, since James, who was called the Lord's brother, and who was his apostle, was immediately made the first bishop. He was Joseph's son by birth, but was ranked as the Lord's brother because of their upbringing together. For this, James was Joseph's son by Joseph's first wife, not by Mary. 
as I said, in many other places and have dealt with um, more clearly for you. And moreover, I find that he was of Davidic descent because of being Joseph's son and that he was born in Nazarite. For he was Joseph's firstborn and thus consecrated. And I found further that he is he also functioned as high priest in the ancient priesthood. Thus he was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies once a year, as Scripture says the law directed the high priest to do. For many before me, Eusebius, Clement, and others, have reported this of him. He was allowed to wear the priestly table uh, tablet. He was allowed to wear the priestly tablet besides, as the trustworthy authors I mentioned have testified in those same historical writings. And so again, you see this reference to, to James being a type of priesthood. Many people think that the priesthood stopped, right? And they said it stopped when John the Baptist had passed away. I just think that's very interesting because, you know, James would have been the son of Mary and she was, her family line was both from Jude, the tribe of Judah and Levite, if you remember the story. Mm-hmm. Um, there was also, I'm sure you've heard of the, uh, the Nag Hammurabi text. Um, yeah. It was basically like, the, whereas the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Judea, there was a, a collection of, it was mostly Gnostic texts that were found in, in uh, Egypt. But among those texts was one called the, the Gospel of Thomas. And it mentions, it says, uh, the disciples said to Yeshua, we know that you're going to leave us. Who will be our leader? And Yeshua said to them, No matter where you are, you have to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. So, you know, according to this canonized book or anything, but it actually says that that it was Yeshua who declared that James the Just should have been or was to be the leader of the Jerusalem Assembly. Okay, yes. So... Um, so this phrase where it says that uh, that the heaven and earth came into being for for James the Just, there's this, this doctrine of the pillars, which is something that is mentioned, kind of mentioned in, in passing by Paul, but it's something that we see uh, written about in you know by the in the Jewish writings like the Talmud, and it's also alluded to in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes that when, when James, Kephas, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision. So you see that you know, Paul is mentioning that James, uh, Peter, and John were, were called pillars. So this this notion of the world came into being or came into existence for the sake of the righteous, who is a pillar of the world, it's actually it's found in, in the Talmud. Um, so I got this reference that says, Rab, Rabbi Eliezer further said, even for the sake of a single righteous man, would this world have been created, for it is said, and God saw the light, and it was uh, for the one who is good, and good means the righteous, as it is said, say ye of the righteous that he is the good one. And then this uh, Rabbi Hiya Ba'aba also said that the Holy One, blessed be he, <coughs> he saw that the righteous were few. Uh, therefore, he planted them throughout all generations, as it is said, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. And then he, uh, he further said that even for the sake of a single righteous man does the world endure, as it is said, but the righteous is the foundation of the world. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that there was a belief that Jerusalem was destroyed because of James, because of the death of James. Basically, what that came, where that came from is that is this, that you know, they believe that if that James as a pillar was essentially like spirit, in a spiritual sense, holding Jerusalem up. There is a lot of history around that and that the people that were in that area looked very <coughs> strongly to James. And we right. know that that once he died, many of them just felt lost. And so mm. we see that in history. He was well liked by the people in that area. He was well liked <laughs> even by many of the people these teachers in that area. So he he uh he carried a lot of weight. Uh, the one thing we see over and over again is that he was well respected by well all respected, the Well respected, yes. Um you know, if you think about it, I mean, James died in 62 common era and he certainly was not killed by the by the people. You know, he was killed by the establishment. Exactly. Um there were some things going on in the temple where the the lower priests had actually built a wall to prevent 
to prevent the view of the sacrifices from the Herodian temple. Because Agrippa II, he would have these dinner parties, and he would have these, I guess, Gentile, you know, Greeks and to his temple, and they would they would sit there at his palace and, and watch the sacrifices in the temple. And it appears that James may have actually been behind the construction of that, of that wall. You know, there's theories out there that that was actually, that was kind of the last straw that ended up getting him killed. But either way, it, it really lines up with what's said in the Dead Sea Scrolls because they have this, that they really spent a, a great deal of paper talking about how much they disliked the Herodians. Um, you know, the Herodians were the subject of a lot of the the problems that the group at Qumran had. They believed that they were corrupting the people, um, that they were impure, and that their offerings in the temple was corrupting the temple itself. And... Um, and, in and other so, words, they were really referring to the Sadducees at that point, weren't they? Right. It was more the, the, the guilt by association. Because the Sadducees tolerated the Herods and you know the Pharisees themselves also, you know, they, they cared more about making peace and compromise instead of this, the strict adher- adherence to the Torah that the, the Ebionites believed that the temple itself was, was profane. That it wasn't it wasn't what the temple was supposed to be, which led uh, to the destruction of the temple and and we know about the seven miracles that happened and the seven miracles are are specific things that was a warning to the people saying that God had left the temple and one was the door of the temple would open by itself there was a voice in the temple that said I have left here. And, and you know the story of the stone, the two stones. They never were able to pick a white stone on atonement again. They, they came up with a black stone every year from 30 A.D. forward to the time of the destruction of the temple. They only were able to pick a black stone. Uh, the string or the thread that would always turn white, the red crimson string, from that point, never turned white again from 30 A.D. forward. So there were some significant things that happened that they called it the seven miracles that really caused the, the followers of, of, of the Messiah to uh, leave out of that area before the fall of Jerusalem. They, when they saw those miracles happen, they said, oh, my goodness, it's time for us to go. Right. And so some did go to Pella, but some also went to an area called Jana. Well, I was um, I was also going to mention, you know, Josephus writes about this group of priests. He calls them the innovators. He said that they, they were introducing these innovations like they refusing the, the Herods and the Caesars. They, they would actually pay for the offerings at the temple. So every day there would be a sacrifice made for Caesar in the, the temple in Jerusalem. And these innovators refused to accept those sacrifices any longer. The, it's the same type of, of purpose that you see written about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if, if James is this righteous teacher, and I believe that he is, then it's also very possible that James was, if he was this opposition high priest, that he was actually involved in constructing that wall to restrict the view that Agrippa had of the temple and of refusing the sacrifices in the temple. This program basically covered, really, the history of James and proved that James was in Jerusalem and was really, at that point, in charge of the church in Jerusalem. Yeah, I just, um, the thing about these these writings, the the New Testament and um, the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, we don't understand the history about that era. No, we don't. Even the, the, the most diligent uh, reader of the scripture really has no idea about what was the political climate like in Judea. You know, who were the scribes and the Pharisees and who was the, the Sadducees and what were their doctrines? And the history is there, but very few people read it. You know, Josephus and Philo and a lot of these, these writers that we have. There's so much that when we understand what's going on in Judea, it really sheds a, a new light on a lot of these scriptures that we have you know, added our own doctrine to. Absolutely. So I would encourage everybody to just you know, get a history book, get a copy of Josephus and read it and just see what was going on. That In that period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, you know, there's about 500 years there, there that we really don't know much about. Indeed, Brother Brad. 
we have to piece together the Apocrypha, that is, the books that are between the Testaments left out of Protestant Bibles. We've got to use the scrolls, and we have to rightly divide them. And then we turn to Josephus, the historian, and his two accounts of the history of those times, his wars and his antiquities. We have to use right judgment and interpretive skills, because there isn't a plain-spoken account, especially of what became of the temple priesthood in the 200 years preceding where the New Testament takes up. And there are quite a number of theories, because that time period was obviously an era of messianic zeal, culminating in a revolt in about 6 AD. But the scrolls show us that for the previous 70 years or so, there was a great build-up of animosity of the righteous against both the usurping temple priesthood and the Herodian kings. Throw in those whom the Dead Sea Scrolls call the Kittim, and the writings or Psalms of the scroll community's righteous teacher, and the history of those times that seems to pop out out of all that mixture is one that sets the stage for a first century of violence, eventual destruction, but also for the advent of a Messiah. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Brad, for giving us the go-ahead to experience this interview. This is 1QH 8.37, the Hodayot, or Thanksgiving Psalms, one psalm by the Teacher of Righteousness. I praise you, O Yahweh, because you placed me as an overflowing fountain in a desert, as a spring of water in a land of dryness, as the cupbearer of the garden. You have seeded a planting of cypress and elm with Selah, a Yahar of your finery. trees of life, those of the mystifying waterway, those who keep themselves hidden among all the trees of the water. They make the branch sprout so as to become a robust planting, yet before they do, they shoot forth one root, then launch all their roots to the river. Its trunk will be open to the living water and it will become the enduring fountain, yea, its trunk a place of trampling for all those who pass by the way. But upon the shoot every creature of the woods will feed, its branches seed for every bird. All the trees of the water will praise themselves for this. They will become famous for their planting, but they will not shoot forth a root toward the river. He who makes the set-apart shoot sprout for the planting of truth, that one is concealed. He is unrecognized, and the seal of his mystery is not perceived. You, O Eli, have put in my mouth an autumn rain for all the children of humankind even as a spring of living waters that will not run dry. If you're interested in learning more about the scrolls, I have a multitude of introductory recordings to take you through portions of many of the more important scrolls, and you can find those under the header Dead Sea Scrolls at www.jspresents.org. We also have a full course in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a beginner's course, and an advanced course. You can find those at veroyahad.org. That's V-E-R-O-Y-A-H-A-D dot org. You'll find a link on there to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which will take you to a page with 20 to 30 hours of beginner to in-depth teachings by both myself and by Mr. Onia Carlson. 
Take the course, and you will, within a short order, be the resident expert on the scrolls in your house. And now I want to say thank you for listening to Jackson Snyder Presents, and I hope that we can get together again in the middle of the night, every night. This is your host. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our variety show, Jackson Snyder Presents. This is a presentation of the Vero Essene Yahad in Vero Beach, Florida. If you would like more information about today's broadcast, email jackson at hebrewnation.net or visit hebrewnationonline.com. Until we meet again, may Yahweh keep you safe and close to home.